isn't scary at all. So, me. Well, I come from a fairly normal, slightly outrageous family. My mum is a musician who teaches a flute, and my dad's a geologist who teaches at Richmond College, where I currently study. As a child, I was extremely ambitious and keen to learn, but not really when told to change activity. I think I probably would have done the same activity for a whole day if I put my mind to it. But my stubbornness prevented the idea of change, and I think so. maybe all kids were like that, but well, it affected me quite a lot. I had an, a great enthusiasm for art and music as a child, but when I say art, I really mean picture books. You know, like this, really. <laughs> age three, aspiring to be a painter. Well, not that I really knew what aspiration was at that age, but sort of the beauty of innocence. I loved the pictures and books, whether they were paintings or illustrations or photographs, even if they were books on rocks. Thanks, Dad. So, pictures and books. Well, I mean, it's a typical childhood love. And age four, well, aspiring to be a child actress, here we go, I would strut around the house quoting Disney or singing the songs. Not that I don't do that anymore, obviously. <laughs> um, and then my confidence was just growing and growing and growing. Age seven, here I am, aspiring to be a musician. As I said, music has been a great passion of mine. I'd even sneak into my mum's lessons at home just to clap or hum along to the, stu to the, to the tunes that her students were playing. Here, I wanted to be a musician, but I couldn't quite find where I was and feel comfortable with, with the instruments I was playing. I tried the flute. It was okay. I tried it for a while. I then tried the saxophone. It was okay as well. And I even continued the piano for quite a while. But unfortunately, again, my stubbornness hit me. And I wasn't motivated to practice. But practicing is absolutely essential for progressing in music as well as probably every other subject maybe any of us can think of. Um, age nine, destined to be a vet, I found percussion. Probably not the most common instrument to play as a nine-year-old, but it felt so right. And so for my 10th birthday, I received a glockenspiel. Maybe not the most common wish of a 10-year-old, but it worked out for me. I was absolutely in my element. I was doing fairly well at school. I was involved in sports teams. And now, I was even in music groups. It was great. All of my aspirations were constantly changing from geologist to vet, to Western actress to Western musician, amongst others. And of course, my love for music continued alongside of these. However, one day, my confidence quite literally died. October 2004, probably age 10, in year six, my sisters and I we were in Mexico, staying with our godparents, learning Spanish at their bilingual school. We'd been sailing on a lake in Mexico. My mother was in Paris hosting a music competition for her students. My dad was in bed in London when he received a phone call. The mast that my instructor and I were handling drifted towards the shore, and the mast came into contact with an overhead trooping high-tension cable. I apologize, this is just after dinner, but some of these pictures may be a little bit distressing. Here I am. That's the result. The, the electricity blasted us meters into the water, and we were pretty much left lifeless. However, my instructor luckily gained consciousness, and so he swam, he swam straight to me. However, I didn't. I was rushed to the nearest hospital where, even after CPR, I was pronounced dead on arrival. And at this point, it seemed like all hope was lost. My pupils were non-responsive. I had no pulse, and I was blue. However, one of the paramedics insisted on driving a further two hours into the city. Yes, this was a risk, but he'd, he'd known of a paediatrician who had dealt with two electrocutions before. And against all odds, here I am. It worked, obviously. It's all right, she lives. <laughs> <laughs> the shock of the electricity, the, se the severity of the head trauma, I was kept in an induced coma for 90 hours to allow the swelling in the brain to decrease. And the accident caused intracranial hypertension, metabolic and respiratory acidosis, 
cerebral edema, which is an excess accumulation of water in the brain, pneumonia, heart failure, renal failure, and 21 other critical diagnostics. There they are in Spanish. Translate them if you can. And then there's pneumonia. On the third day, the nurses discovered the exit wound within my hair. Now, electricity travels with an entrance and an exit. Fortunately, the current, well, it entered, not really fortunately, but it entered on my mouth towards here, and I still have some scars to remain. But the electricity traveled across the skin's surface, fortunately not through the skull to my brain, otherwise I probably wouldn't be here today, but it exited on my head, where it resulted in a 10 by 15 centimetre open lesion. Apologies. On the sixth day, the anaesthesia was reduced. My doctors were particularly worried because they thought that there would be more than a 50% chance I would be brain damaged if I woke up. Now, <coughs> this was okay because as I was regaining consciousness, they were excited by the presence of brain activity in the surrounding monitors. And I was soon able to sort of communicate, but not quite speaking. I couldn't speak at all, let alone speak to the, to the nurses in Spanish. So, they gave me a pen. And I wrote, where am I? They responded, San Jose Hospital. Fair enough. I then said, well, wrote, heart attack. And I sort of scribbled a red mess to represent a heart. I had no idea what had happened. And due to the lack of communication, I wasn't really told until a few days later. After six days, my parents arrived completely unprepared for what they were about to witness. A child un utterly unrecognisable compared to the one they said goodbye to two weeks before. Next, my consultant asked them to speak to me and the surrounding monitors went crazy. It worked. It was great. And so, the next slide, here we are again. Again, we weren't able to speak, but I could wave hello and goodbye with my toes, but my hands and mouth had other drains and contraptions. I can't really say, well, I don't even know what they are, but they were attached to me, so feet were available. Almost a month I was in intensive care, and I'd lost the muscle strength in my legs. So every day, my nurse would sit me in a chair next to my bed, and my dad would read to me. To put it in perspective, he read to me at what was at the time the entire Harry Potter series. I think it was one to five at the time, maybe six. Um, my recovery quickened as I was eating more solid foods. I was talking and eventually I was laughing. And I was moved into my out of ICU after 26 days, into my own sort of sweet area. It was quite fancy. And it had a real toilet, almost a real bed, sort of a lounge area and a mirror. This was particularly interesting and probably the strangest moments I can ever remember. Looking in a face and being told it's you, but seeing a stranger. I had no hair, a scabbed and discoloured face, eyes I couldn't recognise. In addition, well, the eyes, the electricity essentially frazzled my eyes and I soon developed cataracts, you know, just another one of those. And I had 30% vision in my right eye and only 10% remaining in my left eye. Despite being surrounded by family and friends, I felt incredibly alone, almost soulless, to put it. Today, I chose to talk about this in public for the first time because I kind of want to share the simple lessons I've learned that others may overlook or may take for granted because I'm a different person today to the stubborn child I used to be. And so I want to guide you through how what felt like death taught me about life. Now let's begin with the concept of learning. I returned to London in December and during my recovery I've had to come to understand a few things about education. Without the ability of sight, education becomes incredibly problematic. With saline balloons either side of my head for tissue expansion, looking rather like a teddy bear, appearance in school becomes emotionally problematic. 
So I stayed at home for several weeks, where, well, pretty alone, but A, for personal safety, I stayed at home, and I was a distraction to my peers. My parents wanted to make sure that I was cognitively active. So the council were able to provide a set of tutors to make sure that my core studies weren't behind. Um, I was an able worker, a keen worker, and a hard worker. So it would become the highlight of my day when my math tutor approached me with a page of quadratic equations. As my parents created these sort of activities for me to do, for example, one of them that I can remember was to and from hospital consultations in the car. My mum would shout out license plates, bang, bang, and I would either have to create an anagram or multiply them. Perhaps not the same kind of learning as you'd find in schools, but using the same parts of the brain and keeping them interactive. Without continuous practice, the brain becomes lazy. It's sort of like returning after work, like after summer, and not being able to use a pen. And without, you sort of don't really understand the importance of consecutive learning until you begin to lose skills as simple as mental maths. Uh, I've certainly found my passions from these activities that my parents would provide. I think they would buy DVDs such as History Boys and To Kill a Mockingbird and Romeo and Julia. I, for a long time, because I wasn't able to see, I would struggle to see the films. But I could still listen, you know, listen to the script and listen to the soundtrack. And I feel this has developed my auditory ability significantly. As well as absorbing some simple Spanish phrases by listening in a bed for three or so, four weeks. Um, my mum was fascinated at my ability to accept a piece of music, as I said, and again in the car, listening to classical FM, my mum would comment on the melody of the flute or maybe some other pictures in general would ignore other melodies. However, I would notice slightly deeper layers, sort of within the textures. And from my experience of music, I've come to the conclusion that music elevates our spirit and develops our intellectual and emotional side of the brain. Hence, my love for music. My next reflection is probably judgment, I think, because when I returned to school, well, before I returned to school, I can remember vividly standing outside my classroom. I wasn't able to walk in. I felt too much of a stranger. I even cried to my mum, Mum, I can't go in. I'm a monster. I can't go in. No, I didn't look a monster, but I knew I certainly didn't look normal. And again, it took me a long time to understand why, but I came to the realisation that it wasn't necessarily the discomfort from stares or comments, as I was afraid how people would react, but more so the discomfort within me and how I'd react to them. This lesson I learned in 2005, when I started secondary school, age 12. Starting in a new environment is scary for anyone, and we can we all agree on that, but starting secondary school with a shaven head and an appropriately black hat, pretty terrified, if I'm honest. So, I think question, um, students and teachers would even question or criticise why I wore a hat, or why I often wasn't in school. And I think three times my hat was stolen in a hit and run by students. But, you know, it's life. Um, so I began to question myself and sort of try to find and realise why I felt so just, like, uncomfortable about this. You'd be thinking, well, comments and stares, I mean, it's pretty uncomfortable. But it just didn't really feel right. And I came to the realisation that it is completely rational to question something you don't know. So I decided to leave my hat at home. I realised the very thing I used to hide away, ironically, was the very device that was drawing all the attention in. And so I left my hat at home. And just like that, the question stopped. I imagine what had happened about me had been spread around quickly. And so people saw, people knew, and they moved on. It's quite difficult to talk about this because Yes, judgment affects everyone, but everyone has their own sort of feelings towards it. And I think unless we have our own sort of mission to overcome it, we have to understand ourselves. And how can you really understand others when you can't understand yourself? 
my last reflection is simply the importance of positivity. Many of our experiences bring great teachings to us, and many of our greatest opportunities, our greatest learning opportunities even, come from our most painful experiences. No good can come from resisting and struggling. I mean, I'll tell you that now, and I think we can all relate to one another and realize the need for patience when it comes to this kind of thing. But why not, if you have the willingness to learn, why not grow from these lessons? And I think with a combination of patience, the ability to understand myself, I think my confidence and ambition have truly returned. Perhaps not 100%, but I still have time. So what's today's aspiration? You may be thinking, music, but not really. I can remember vividly sitting in my English class in well, age 15, year 10, having a slight daydream, and it hit me, oh my god, I have to be a teacher. <laughs> it's not the worst thing in the world, it's all right, my parents, teachers. Before GCSE, I'd never been that interested in English, but the indulgence of depth and exploration and analysis was just so exciting. I mean, I guess I sound like a real nerd now, but visualizing imagery, I mean, it's brilliant. I've just recently applied to five universities to study English literature and hope that one day I'll be a teacher. And I wanted to express my passion for learning and education, how I strive to continue learning past school, and how I want to change this much I know into this much I want to give back. Now, to conclude my speech, I'm going to play you one of my favorite pieces. It's quite long. Well, not really. It's only in three sections. But I hope that you enjoy it as much as I do. Thanks for listening.